I, uh, I want to take a quick minute and kind of reframe the issue with sage grouse and, and the title here says sage grouse and mineral development. It's actually mineral and energy. Um, in Wyoming we, we have wind as well as uh, minerals uh, as most states are dealing with. Um, the issue quite simply put is that we had declining numbers of birds at the end of the last century. Uh, we, we've had a loss of habitat. This map depicts what is anticipated or expected was the range of sage grouse. I don't know that we can say absolutely that it's uh, uh, a hard, hardwired map, but as you can see we've lost approximately 40 to 50 percent of what may have been the historic range. Uh, challenges to existing habitat uh, and those aren't necessarily driven by human activity. Uh, there are a lot of challenges. Sagebrush, uh, it appears based on the, the latest knowledge that, that I've had uh, to behave a bit like lodgepole pine and that it takes a catastrophic event and then it uh, reestablishes. Uh, Jeff Beck here, here I, I think the last that I saw was they thought it was maybe on a 30 year time frame you'd get big stands of sagebrush then you wouldn't get any recruitment in 30 years you would have another one. Um, that certainly has played out over the last 40 or 50 years uh, and is an issue. Challenges to the bird, uh, the bird itself uh, as an example, that West Nile, if they get it, they die. Uh, it isn't one of those deals where they develop an immunity or, or something, and that's a new challenge. Likewise, predators that we didn't have in the past. Uh, the oppressive nature of the Endangered Species Act, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. And then the broad distribution of sage grouse. We've never tried to tackle uh, an issue that, that is so wide-ranging. Um, and when you really look at how the Endangered Species Act is structured, it really thought more in terms of things like the Amargosa toad or uh, the desert lizard or things that are fairly localized. So as you expand that out to the broad range of sage grouse, it's a different story. Declining numbers of birds, uh, this is Wyoming's uh, trend line and you can see we had a, a fairly substantial decline over time. That did right itself in about 2003 and, and they have come back up. Uh, that's difficult because historic numbers are a little sketchy, you know. Uh, there are all these stories about the passenger pigeon, sage grouse blackening the sky when you walk through the sagebrush. Well, I don't know how many that is. Uh, one guy's estimate that's 30, uh, another guy's estimate it's 30,000. We, we don't know. Um, the population cycle, that's as you can see through the, the bars in the graph. Let counts are not highly reliable and multiple stressors on sage grouse populations drive that up and down. Loss of habitat comes from natural attrition, weather, conversion, human population, invasive species, and all adds up to fragmentation. Fragmentation is the issue on one side that we have to deal with with this species. You have challenges to the bird, disease I mentioned, the newcomer predators. Fidelity, it has a low reproductive rate. They make a single nesting attempt. They don't go back and try again. They just fail. Their migratory nature, that's something new. And the fact that they're cyclical populations. The fidelity issue is one that, that a lot of people don't, don't grasp. And I don't think most of us do because the assumption is, well, if you have put stress on a species, it'll, it'll move away from the stress. With sage grouse, they have hardwired success strategies that have worked for eons. And because they're a prey species, because they, they have to succeed with a low reproductive rate, if they're successful, they go back and do it again. And they will go back and do it again until they aren't there anymore. So if a male breeds on a lek, he's going back. Uh, it's not unlike the bar scene in most university towns. Um, <laughs> if a female uh, breeds and nests successfully, she will go at times within meters of where she nested the first the year before to try and nest again. And over time, if you look at that with, with the normal evolutionary pressures that were on sage grouse, it works. It works because chances are it's going to be successful again. Well, my favorite example of where that doesn't necessarily work is when they extended the runway in Jackson Hole Everybody said, well, what the heck? They're not that stupid. They're going to put a big runway out there. They're going to land jumbo jets. These birds are not going to stand around and, and mate while that's going on. Well, we were wrong. They're right out there on the tarmac, and the jets are dodging the sage grouse until finally, over time, those sage grouse probably will disappear. Uh, the basics, I've, I've hit that, and I'm not going to 
talk much about it, but sage grouse are known as a landscape species, and that's the important part. They require a lot of different types of habitat, and at times, huge ranges. So where they breed and where they summer may be 60 miles apart. Uh, the birds that I used to have at, when I was managing Red Canyon Ranch, those birds bred and nested down by Hudson, Wyoming, and they summered on South Pass, if you know where that is. It's 40 miles. And they start that when they hatch. They start walking on their little three-quarter inch legs and heading for the hills. Uh, they've got to dodge rivers. They've got to dodge highways. They've got to go through subdivisions. They have to go through a lot of things that they never historically had to deal with. So you have to think of them in terms and context of a large landscape. They are also a talisman for other species. There are 73 species of greatest ecological concern in Wyoming that are found in the same habitat type. That's about a third of our species of highest concern. Let me talk about the realities of a listing because what I'm finding is there are people who think, well, we'll just deal with that when that comes along. And what we did in Wyoming is we analyzed what happens if you list the species versus what happens if you have a coherent plan for conservation. Every bird is covered under the Endangered Species Act. Every bird. Now in a sense what that says is every bird is equal. But if you look at trying to conserve a species, you have to do it by conserving multiple populations. And in looking at that, every bird doesn't become equal. Where you have 400, 500 bird leks in western Wyoming or in northern Nevada or in, in parts of Utah, you can't look at that habitat and that population in the same light that you do at birds that are on the extreme edge of the range in the Dakotas, California, and other places. It's not to take anything away from the birds that are making a living there, but if we're looking 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, you've got to look at those that are most productive in the best habitat. Critical habitat is all suitable habitat, and you go look at the range and you say, okay, that's historic, that's current, and that's where we have our, our high density populations today. A consultation is required for all federal nexus. Example of this, if I want to put an oil well on private land with private minerals, but my road goes through a 40 that's owned by the BLM, I will have a Section 7 consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service before that well is permitted. Every single APD, every single road application, every single well permit for water, everything that has a federal connection has to go through that consultation. Now, some people think, well, does that mean we just walk into Fish and Wildlife, shake hands and say, hey, I want to drill a well, and you sign on the bottom of my sheet, and I go back and I drill the well. No, it isn't that simple. It's a full-blown process. In Utah, you have one person to do that for every single action that takes place in the state with Fish and Wildlife. In Wyoming, we have two. We're really lucky. Okay? It's all birds and all habitats. You will have more restrictive stipulations than you have in the Wyoming plan or in other plans that are being developed by the states. And take applies on all lands, private, state, federal. Take in the law is defined as harm or harass. Okay? So let's go back to my little male sage grouse who's trying to breed for the first time and I fire up my tractor at daylight so I can go out and, and cut hay, I believe somebody's going to make the argument that I've harassed that poor little feller while he was trying to go out and find a girlfriend because she couldn't hear him or she was distracted by the sound of my tractor. It is so broad that it leaves open a challenge to everything that we might consider doing. The strategy that we followed is to say, conserve the populations and habitats where we can have the most effect. That goes back to that zeroing in on where do you really grow birds well? Where do you have opportunity to grow more birds? Where do you have the greatest ability to conserve a species? 
We want to maintain economic opportunity and particularly where we don't have major conflicts. That's, there are areas where you're going to look at it and say, you know, here's what our economic opportunity is, here's what the challenge to the bird is, and you're going to decide in favor of economics at times, just as you're going to decide in favor of the species at other times. We want to build a sound ecological and economic model for conservation that we can transfer other places. And most importantly, we included the major stakeholders in the decision process. Susan White will tell you that that's somewhat uh, aggravating at times. Uh, it is, but in the end, it is probably the best way to achieve conservation for this species. You have to address the key threats. Fragmentation is the big threat on the biological side. The other is regulatory authority. What can you put in place that assures that we're going to do the things we say we'll do? Just voluntarily saying, okay, we'll take care of sage grouse is not going to work. I think the graph shows it hasn't worked. So you have to have some ability to go in and say, yes, this is the plan, this is what we're going to do. That's why in Wyoming we believe a plan is important because it gives us a road map. It tells us these are the things that we can tolerate. These are the things the birds can handle. Fragmentation in, in our part of the world is mineral development, renewable energy, transmission and pipelines, and to some degree fire and invasive species. When you get into Nevada, you can almost flip this list, take ag conversion out, and it goes the other way from bottom to top. In Montana, ag conversion is an issue. But those are the primary vectors that are problematic on fragmentation. We start with the birds we have. This is Wyoming's core area map, lek driven, because that, that is where we count them. And the red dots are the areas where we have the highest density of male sage grouse and consequently of females as well. The assumption is that if you have that kind of density, that's where you have the best habitat. And so we built our core areas off of where we had good solid data that showed these are, these are where the birds are. These are the areas you've got, you've got to look at enhancing and protecting. When you do that, you look at the existing uses, and, and people from Western Wyoming will tell you this chunk right here, these are big leks. These are very large concentrations of sage grouse. That's also the Jonah field, which is drilled at times at 20 acre spacing. It's disingenuous to go in and say we're going to protect sage grouse where we've already made decisions that are counter to that goal. So be pragmatic, be realistic, and say that area is going to get developed. Now what you do adjacent to that area and how you do it becomes doubly important because that's where you're going to try to absorb some of that of impact, but you're also looking at you know that that area is highly productive for sage grouse. Again, recognize existing rights. Uh, the black here are where we had, when we started, those were all permitted wells, or drilled wells, excuse me. You're not going to do a lot up in the northeast part of the state, up in here, at that well density. And that frustrates people, it frustrates biologists, it frustrates other people that, well, why didn't you declare that some kind of a sage-grouse zoo? Because it isn't a sage-grouse zoo. It's been developed. Then we adjust based on local knowledge. So we went back to our local working groups twice and had them adjust. The red are the areas where we added uh, sage grouse uh, habitat in. Uh, there are others that were taken out as we looked at, at this on a very close scale boots on the ground type analysis. And then verified the assumptions. This is the veg layer that shows that yes, we did get it right. So you focus your conservation on your highest areas of rewards. And again, the red in indicating your highest uh, males and, and on down. You can see what that means for northeast Utah, for western Wyoming, and, and the areas where you have the greatest ability to do the most good. That means we have to change our historic model for conservation. Projects in the past were driven by the resource and cost. Now, if we're talking about mining gold, you can't go mine gold if there's no gold there. Okay? You can't produce oil if there's no oil under the ground. But when I say they were driven by the resource and cost, 
most things were engineering based. And if I go to an engineer, if I walk down here in Logan to walk in an engineering firm and say, I need to put a pad on this section and I need a road, I'm going to get the shortest, straightest route to do that at the lowest cost. That doesn't account for sage grouse or their habitat, okay? But that's how we've done things. We also had a model that called for mitigation. I've said for years that really all it was was glorified extortion. I'm the company, Brian King, I'm Rocky Mountain, I come in and I say, I will give you one million dollars. And the biologist says, no, five million dollars. Do we see where this is headed? Ultimately, we end up at $2.75 million. That money is paid into a fund. And then on the other end, the biologists say, trust me, we'll use it for good things. And all of a sudden, the Game and Fish Department has six new trucks and four new employees. We've got to get away from those models. They don't work, and they won't work in the long run if we don't start thinking in terms of mitigation being something that actually affects the species we're trying to, to enhance. We have changes in understanding of the species needs, okay? Same thing happened on the other side as far as what the biologists were doing. We also had an infinity paradigm, at unlimited land. If I'm an oil company and I look at that and I go, well, my goodness, sage grouse, they got lots of places to go. We also think that they're portable. If I put something here and that's where little Johnny Sage Grouse wants to get lucky, he'll move over here. No, he won't. They're not portable. They don't pick up. You can't move them. It's very hard to translocate them. You guys in Utah have done more with that than anybody in the world. And their resilience and their resistance are not infinite either. The idea that they'll just absorb the impact and, and, and we'll go on about our business no, that won't happen, and we've shown that that won't happen. The best available science tells us that we should use a strategy that avoids, minimizes, mitigates, while we understand the tolerances of the species, things like 5% disturbance per section, that came out of the science, and we monitor to see if we're right. We don't just assume and then find out that we were wrong all along. So it causes some paradigm shifts. When you think about avoidance, project design suddenly becomes mitigation. I met with an oil and gas company down in Denver uh, two weeks ago, and it was the first time that the engineers and biologists were sitting at the same table and talking about what they do. And one of the engineers said, what would you tell me to do first if we're going to do this development? I said, I'd walk down the hall to the biologist and lay the map on his desk and say, where are we going to have problems? Well, that's where they were at the end of the day as well. Okay? But your project design can be the mitigation. The idea that you have to pay millions of dollars is all well and good, but if you go and you put your road in a place that it doesn't impact nesting habitat, that actually does something, and the added cost of doing that should be credited back to the industry as their mitigation. You need the biology early in the process, and we need to think about co-location. Where can we do something where we've already had an impact? In other words, we have, we have seen permits come in for different activities where the proposal is to drill the well in sagebrush, and 100 yards away is an old abandoned wheat field. Well, the grouse are going to use the sagebrush. They're not going to use the wheat field. Put the pad on the damn wheat field. Get out on the ground and look at it. Minimization, you can, that happens through the footprint. We had an oil and gas development in central Wyoming. The original proposal was about 5,000 acres. When they went back and retooled it and started to look at that as a minimization effect, the final was 1,200. They were able to group wells. They were able to do a lot of things to avoid that habitat. Reclamation. We've kind of waved our hand at reclamation and said, yes, we're going to do it. Oh, that's great. I could have taken, uh, what, 440 miles of pipeline photos yesterday that show that it wasn't done. Halogeton and cheatgrass is not reclamation. 
So we've got to step up what we do on the reclamation side. And then finally, we just identified corridors and said, look, if we're going to have all these linear features, let's try to get them somewhere where we're going to have the least possible impact. And finally, mitigation. We have to look at that in the sense of results first. We have promised to pay tomorrow for a hamburger today for decades. And when it doesn't pan out, we don't have enough bonding authority to make it work. We don't have enough, uh, the company that may have done it may be long gone. Uh, or we get the finger pointing, you know, the thing everybody's pointing at everybody else as to why it didn't work. We need dedicated funding. By that I mean we don't buy pickup trucks with the money for mitigation. We go do mitigation for the species. And we need incentives and concession. There's a company I talked to this week that has a, a lease that will expire in 10 years. It's less than 10 at this point. They have an obligation to drill 25 wells. They want to drill five. But if they don't drill 25, then they lose their lease. That's plumb stupid. Okay? We got to think in terms of, okay, can we use some of that as conservation? Can we stage that development? Can we allow concessions so that we don't end up with mandated decisions that are neither productive for the energy producer nor sage grouse. Threat management, is it manageable or not, is the first thing that we have to, to determine. Because some of them are and some of them aren't, and we have to be honest and pragmatic about that, and we have to look at it in the context of short and long-term consequences. There are other issues, the lease terms that I just mentioned. We have the ability in BLM to suspend production or suspend uh, requirements for conservation purposes. I would wager that if I were to throw that out and do a poll of the energy producing entities and say, Is, does the BLM have that authority, it would probably come back to be 90-20 that the BLM does not have that authority. So there's a little secret that shouldn't be a secret. A lot of times it's because we don't ask the right questions. We don't walk in and say, could I? And a lot of times it's because the bureaucrats don't want to answer yes because it's more work. Well, we have to get beyond that. Stage development, unitization. We just had a long and we're, we're working through that in unitization on oil and gas. That's one of those things that the, the reason that it was done historically isn't what will help sage grouse. But unitization can really be a positive when you look at conservation in the long term. But it's not our normal paradigm. And finally, ancillary impacts, my favorite story of all time. I went out with FMC Corporation that wanted to drill six wells. These are wells that are five, six hundred feet deep. They're drilled with a workover rig. I can drive a workover rig cross country over most of the landscape in Utah and Wyoming. Stand it up, poke my hole be done. I need a mud pit about as big as a bushel basket and I need a hole six inches. I went out on one where one regulatory agency at the state required a two acre drilling pad for that workover rig. That pad had to have the topsoil removed and stockpiled so it could be later used. It was identical to the pad in that they both grew halogenin. 100% halogen. Okay? It isn't going back, it isn't going to be reclaimed. But you didn't need it. Now, a federal agency looked in their little manual and said, okay, to get the drill, that workover rig out there, we need a road. And on page whatever, they picked the road. 15 foot crown and ditch road for about a mile. So you took out a mile of 15 foot linear feature that you didn't need to put a two acre pad that you didn't need in to drill one well. We've got to be smarter than that. That is fragmentation at its worst. What are the results? We've got multiple wells from a single pad. The road siding and design I mentioned. Remote sensing on that same thing when the, when the, when the lights went on and people got excited FMC said, well, 
what else could we do to minimize this? Because we need to be able to get out there to those, those six wells. And one guy said, we can remotely sense those wells. We can? Yeah, we'll do that. But we still might need to get there. And I offered up one of my friends who works for him and said, well, get him a pair of snowshoes and, and all is taken care of. Well, the compromise was that really all they needed was a four-wheeler road that would go out in one path, they could get out and get to the remote equipment or get to the wells. That's all they needed. Their original design, the drawings were on the table, was a 20-foot crown and ditch road, went out and then each well had its own access point. So how much fragmentation can you eliminate by just thinking outside the box a little? Same thing with mine plans, same thing with reclamation, conservation easements and other things that are out there that are being done. The biology, the core areas focus you on where you can do the most good. Invasive species have to be considered in everything we do, particularly in Utah, Nevada, Idaho, but also in Wyoming and Montana. The decisions need to be made on the ground. Bruce Pendry and I were just talking. When you get out and look at what's happening out there, sometimes the standards you have don't apply. They're good, firm guidelines. You use those to drive your decision making, but your decision making gets done on the ground if you're going to have a positive impact on grouse. You need to be realistic about the relative value of habitat. It isn't all the same. I've said that before. And finally, we have to focus on reclamation. I'm not going to go through the history of this issue. Uh, we've been dealing with this now for 14 years. It's not something that I invited upon myself, I will guarantee you. Um, but I think that we're moving in the right direction. The reality is we can do these things if we do them with intelligence. But if we lock ourselves into the paradigms that we have or the way we've always done things, we're all ultimately going to fail. The last example of that that I'd give you, when we started our process in 2007, one of the environmental representatives said, why don't we directionally drill? And the oil and gas people came in and said, we can't. Well, one of them said, well, we can, but we can't afford it. And another one said, well, we might be able to afford it, but we don't really know what we're doing. At our last sage grouse team meeting in Casper three weeks ago, one of the company representatives stood up and said, we can directionally drill this entire field, and in fact, it's cheaper for us to do that. In five years, the technology moved to a point where what was virtually impossible became the preferred alternative. And yet, you still have that reluctance to admit that, and, and, and I don't blame the industry people because the minute they come in and say, it's cheaper for us to do this, it's easier, it's better for us, somebody on the far extreme other end says, you bastards lied to us. They didn't lie at the time they told the truth. It's changed, and we have to be looking for things that we can do more effectively all the time, and then let the old way go. I mean, good Lord, if we were still doing it the way we started, we'd have hand-dug wells out there, okay? Again, the strategy is defensible management strategy. There's flexibility in the core areas when you have adequate data to show that it will work. We have a better understanding of sage-grouse tolerances. I think we're finding that all the time. Uh, there's a paper that, that Dr. Beck just had out, what, six months ago, Jeff, on the uh, fact that treatments for sagebrush don't necessarily immediately translate to sage-grouse population booms. So if you're going to do it, you've got to think in terms of 20 years. How much are you going to affect now looking 20 years at getting that reward back? Well, if your birds don't persist through that 20 years, you're never going to get the lift. That's important that we know that. And finally, avoid wherever possible, mitigate where not. That, that's a good sound philosophy for us to use as we move forward with development of energy and minerals and we conserve sage grouse. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has said, if you'll implement this and you'll do it and you mean it, and you all put your shoulder to the wheel, it'll work. We think it'll, it'll work, and we, we think this is the way that we ought to do conservation as we move into the future.
Thank you. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, I, I think that uh, certainly as we developed this model, we, we had that same, uh, it's an ethical almost uh, dilemma. Nobody's writing them off, first of all. What we did is said, where do we have the greatest opportunity? Because at the time, what we were doing is if we had a million dollars to spend, we divided it up among all equally. So what we did is we under conserve the birds that have the greatest ability to persist and we over conserved little two bird lacks here and there that, that may or may not ever persist. The corridors are identified in our plan. We have that all the linkages and, and they are managed differently than outside. Uh, they're also managed differently than inside because they're, the uses are different. And as far as the genetics, what we, we actually built the core area concept looking at genetics and saying we can't afford to lose the birds in northeast Wyoming. There are core areas there, but they're not in that one big one that I showed because we didn't think that we could realistically say, yeah, we're going to conserve sage grouse with the pressures that were there. So I think those are all valid points, but I do think we've addressed them. You know, yeah, on the periphery of the range, are we potentially going to lose birds? Yeah, I think we, we may. But if we do nothing or if we list it, we're probably going to have the same result. Yeah. Do you have any scientific evidence that these fringe populations are not important to the species? There's a, the ongoing study right now, there's a feather study that they're looking at DNA to assure that they are, are not genetically different. If they come back as a genetically different base, that's, gonna, that's a game changer. And we're all aware of that. The evidence that's out there today, and I, I can only rely on what the biologists tell me, is that that is not the case. Now, you look at the bi-state population, little different decision. Um, I think when we talk, and Terry Messmer can answer this better than I can for Utah, I think you may start to pick up some differences as you get on the extreme southern end of the range here in Utah. That's an unknown, but most of those areas like that, again, were kept in some kind of a core status so that we have that decision-making ability or that, that range of decision-making ability in the future. It's a good point. The question was, have I had experience with the federal regulatory agencies? Yes, unfortunately I have. Um, if I'd have known what this was going to be like, I probably would have slogged on and gone to medical school or something. Uh, what would I recommend we do to change that? I think and, and one of them is, I don't think, going to happen. We, we just, the idea of going in and looking at how effective the Endangered Species Act is seems to be anathema to too many people. It should be done because it clearly is not doing the things that it should in cases like sage grouse. Okay? What I think the model that's developed or developing that will work is a partnership whereby you don't get a top-down mandate on how to conserve. The conservation objectives team on which I served looked at that and said, if you're going to save sage grouse, if you're going to conserve them and you're going to take care of them, you've got to, <coughs> to do that at the closest level to where they live. So you have a framework under which you do that and you allow the states, the counties, the local working groups to devise how that's done. Um, I think that's probably the model that's going to be most effective. Just as a follow-up, since that's the chat, that used to be the way it worked in the early part of the 1900s, and still doesn't work that way now. They claim it's a funding issue, so how do you change that? Well, I don't think it's a funding issue at all. I think it's the opposite, to be honest with you. If you, let's just go to a listing scenario. Uh, the Wyoming Corps area plan goes away. Uh, that bird now belongs to the federal government. 
our funding, which last year, specific sage-grouse related funding in Wyoming was over $25 million for conservation easements, habitat improvements, monitoring, uh, research work, that goes away. In Utah, you have a mandate that if the species isn't hunted, you can't spend any state dollars on it. That goes away. So it's, it's not a money-driven thing if you look at it pragmatically and say, who has the money to do it, who has the will to do it, who has the knowledge to do it? It's locally. The feds don't have the money to do this. And, and, and I fear, quite honestly, if you were to list sage grouse, I think it may be the worst thing you can possibly do for the species because they lose the, the entire support base that's built around them today. Other question, yes sir. Bob, could you speak about the experience of co-location of the biologists? And back to this gentleman's question. The Bureau and Congress set aside in 2005, $26 million a year worth of offshore rental income to establish seven oil and gas pilot offices, 80% of the Bureau's major oil and gas approvals in seven offices throughout the Rockies. Mm -hmm. We hired 235 people, the audologists in those, in those offices, including as an example in Wyoming, four Wyoming, oil, or four Wyoming fish and game biologists that were co-located in BLM offices. Also, four U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologists to deal, to deal specifically with consultation. <laughs> What we found was when you co-located those people, the biologists generally agree. Yep. So there, there's little bits and starts. And a big part of this was to equate the biological experts with the operational side. That right. Just illustrated. We had fish and wildlife service biologists who were used to doing consultations over 30, 45, or 60 days. Once they understood what the industry was doing and they were out on the ground right. working with other biologists, they were able to do these consultations in a week or a day. Major improvements. Now there's formality on some of these consultations, but the concept is getting people on the ground, getting the resources out there, and doing it smarter. There are solutions here. We do affect these things. Yeah, I, it, that was very well put. The only thing that I would add is that in doing that, and, and, and it was pretty interesting when I was in Denver to watch this oil company actually do what, we talk, what we're talking about, where the engineer turned to the biologist and said, what would you do? And all of a sudden they've got the map and he's saying, I'd avoid this, I'd do this. And the engineer is saying, we can do that, we can do that. Then the cost side comes in and says, what's it going to cost us? Well, that's where I think we've had our major flaw is we don't have a means of crediting or giving, uh, calling that mitigation, which it is. Money is not mitigation. Actions that avoid conflict is mitigation. So why would we choose to take the money when we could have the actions? That, that's a huge step. But you get there by having that kind of, uh, one thing I said about our team, uh, and I was laughing with, about Susan, dealing with all those interests, the learning experience is phenomenal. Um, I remember the Audubon representative at one point asked a question, and, and it was kind of open-ended, why don't we do this? And the oil and gas people said, well, here's why we don't do this. And he said, I'd never heard that. Now, on another occasion, the oil and gas people said, could we do this? And the Audubon people were saying, yeah, and if you added this X, Y, and Z, it would be even better. That became a standard operating procedure for that company. That's what we need to get to if we really want to do conservation work. Yeah, we, we did, the question was, what about outside the, the core areas which are lek driven, which is breeding area driven? By buffering that, using the, this was Holleran's stuff, we buffered at 5.2 miles and said 90 some percent of the birds are, will live there, will be found in that area, they'll nest in that area, that's the area they're going to use. Particularly where you have those big, heavy density populations, those buffers built on buffers, built on core, built on core, um, as you could see on the map. The assumption was that we're picking up their winter areas and that we're picking up all those seasonal habitats. We then went out and, and looked for areas where we were wrong. We found one in western Wyoming. We identified that as a wintering area. Obviously the stipulations in a wintering area are different than they would be in a breeding area. 
uh, seasonal alone. You're, you've got a different uh, NSO that you might apply or a different use standard. So as we learn more, we, we can add that back in, but the, the best fit, uh, and USGS just is finishing that analysis, is that we probably are in the 90th percentile of capturing the winter by capturing those lek areas and the appropriate uh, uh, circumference around the, or uh, radius around those that, that will encompass those different seasonal habitats. So we're, pretty, we're, we're actually pretty happy with the way it worked out, but we did assume we better go look at that and make sure we aren't uh, doing nothing but breeding habitat and losing the winter stuff. Yeah. And I think, Terry, wouldn't you say that's probably going to hold true here in Utah? Where are you? Where are you? Yeah. It's a little different because of the migratory nature of the birds here, but I, I, I have some confidence that you're probably pretty close here as well. Yeah. yeah. Most of that area, we're actually going through right now, we're mapping our database the last 15 years to come up with all that information. So we'll, we'll be close. But. Good. Well, you know landowners, and, and landowners in Wyoming are, are, if anything, steroid examples of landowners. Their initial reaction was, no way, I'm, I don't like it, it's an infringement on my rights. I would say right now that, and, and this is what happens with the core area thing, it, 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 it's pretty universal, uh, and I'll, I'll put it in an oil and gas context because it does illustrate it, but I, I was at a meeting again three weeks ago, a guy with Anadarko Petroleum came up and said, you know, we really don't like this. And I said, yes, I do know that. And he said, but we can't think of anything better. And and that, that's kind of where people are. They look at it and say, pragmatically it makes sense, biologically it makes sense, from an economic point of view it makes sense, we still don't like it. Well, I, I, I can't help that. I, I, if you liked it, it probably wouldn't work. Um, but the other thing that, that the landowners have done is found that, for and you know this very well, Steve, for the last decade or two, we've started to come to the realization that these landowners out there and that these users are providing ecological goods and services that go far beyond the beef or the lamb or the wheat or whatever else they're producing. And we've never really given credit for that other than lip service. All of a sudden now through programs like the Sage Grouse Initiative at, at, at NRCS, through uh, private groups like Miles and the Mule Deer Foundation, through groups like I Manage. There's an economic incentive that goes with that, and there are many of them. We cannot handle the number of requests we have for conservation easements in sage-grouse core areas. It's, it's on, the, on the order of two to three hundred million dollars in requests out there that people would like to do to conserve that habitat. You throw on top of that people who are looking at treatments, the people who are looking at habitat provision. Uh, one example, it, as, as you can see those paradigms shift and norms become new norms, Every water development that we do now has a sage grouse component built into it, whether it's a guzzler or whether it's an overflow that creates wet meadow. And you've probably seen the one down in, in uh, southern Sublette County. They put in a little wet meadow. It's probably an acre. And it's where their overflow came out of their tank. They just drained that out into a little slough that used to be a spring-fed slough. I was in there last fall, and you couldn't take a step without stepping on sage grouse feathers. The birds just absolutely flock to that in the fall and, and use it, and you know you see things like that. So there are new norms that are coming forward all the time. But the one good thing about sage grouse is they really, there's not, how do you hate a sage grouse? I mean, God, they're dumb, they're, they're not real pretty, they aren't good to eat, but how do you hate something like that? Now, that, I'm glad I'm not doing this with wolves, because that's a different story. But, but that really is kind of where they're at, I think.